Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The periodontic radiographic surveys are based upon those years during which the patient experiences the greatest potential for caries, which are approximately four years of age. Again, after the eruption of several permanent teeth at about seven to eight years of age. And finally, the third peak between 11 and 13 years of age, subsequent to the eruption of bicuspids and permanent second molars. They are also based upon the dental development of the patient, in which case the eruption of the permanent cuspids. For the child patient, posterior bite wings are routinely advised at six month recall appointments. The zero bite wing is taken approximately between two and a half years and six years. The number two bite wing is taken between six and 12 years. And after 12 years, the number three bite wing is frequently utilized. The criteria for acceptable posterior bite wings for the number zero film and also for the number two film should include the following points. The plane of occlusion should be located approximately halfway between the upper and lower border of the film. The film should include the distal one half of the cuspid in the mesial or anterior area and the distal portion of the most posteriorly erupted tooth. The film should be of adequate contrast and density and there should be no overlap between the interproximals of the teeth. Looking at the number zero posterior bite wing, in detail we would get the following information. One, the, the presence and depth of interproximal caries. Two, the thickness of enamel and the thickness of dentin between caries and the pulp. And three, the size and shape of the pulp chamber. Additional information to be gained from the posterior bite wing includes the proximal contour and the gingival seat of restorations. And this film can be used to check whether overhangs or poor gingival seat exists. Ectopic eruption of the permanent first molars can be ascertained from posterior bite wings. And in this instance, we are seeing an ectopically erupting permanent first molar, which is locked under the distal of a primary second molar and has caused considerable resorption of the distal surface of the molar. The environment of the root furcation area can be examined on the posterior bite wing. And in this instance, we see bifurcation involvement and internal resorption of the distal root of a primary second molar. In addition to the routine posterior bite wing radiographs taken at regular intervals, two anterior occlusal radiographs should be secured at least once between two and a half four and four years of age. And it is preferable to use two, number two periapical films as the occlusal radiographs. Also, from four and a half to nine years of age, occlusal radiographs should be taken at least once. And this should be preferably in the mixed dentition. 
at which time a folded number four anterior occlusal radiograph placed with the folded area outward records both the maxillary and the mandibular arches on one radiograph. The criteria for acceptable occlusal radiographs include, number one, the middle of the film should match the midline of the patient. Number two, the incisal edge of the primary or the permanent centrals. should be projected approximately two to three millimeters from the folded edge or the outer exterior edge of the film. Number three, the central incisors should exhibit minimal elongation or shortening. Number four, overlap of the centrals and laterals should be avoided unless anatomically present. And lastly, the film should be of an average contrast and density. From anterior occlusal radiographs, the following information may be derived. Number one, congenitally missing teeth. As you see in this radiograph, there are both congenitally missing primary laterals which should occupy these spaces and congenitally missing permanent laterals which would be developing in these areas. Or supernumerary anterior teeth may be developing and can be seen in the anterior occlusal films as are seen by two midline supernumeraries in this film. Secondly, possible presences, uh, presence of pathology or developmental anomalies, as in this case where there appears a primary geminated tooth. Or we may also see the presence of periapical pathologies as we see in this film in which there is combined a cyst which is being outlined, a pericoronal cyst involving the central incisor and also a small odontoma which is also in the field. Periapical radiographs are utilized as a part of the pedodontic radiographic surveys. From four and a half years of age, four number zero periapical radiographs of the four posterior quadrants are used to augment posterior bite wings and anterior occlusal radiographs. As is seen here, these four periapical films are located in the corners of the mountings. From eight to nine years of age, four number zero periapical radiographs of the cuspid areas are secured to check the eruption of the permanent cuspids. From 10 to 12 years of age, six number zero periapical radiographs of the anterior teeth, three of the maxillary anteriors, and three of the mandibular anterior teeth are secured. And additionally, eight number two periapical radiographs of the bicuspid and molar regions should be taken, four on the right and four on the left as are illustrated in the outer rows of this mounting. The criteria for acceptable periapical radiographs 
include the following. Number one, the teeth for which the periapical radiographs are secured should include the whole root length of the erupted teeth, as is illustrated by this mandibular primary second molar, and as much of the underlying succedaneous tooth bud as is possible. Number two, the buccal cusps, or in the case of the anterior teeth, the incisal edges, included in the periapical radiograph should be located approximately two to three millimeters from the outer edge of the radiograph. Number three, minimum elongation or shortening of the teeth should occur. And number four, the film should be of average contrast and density. The following information may be derived from periapical radiographs. Number one, anomalies of number, size, shape, texture, and anomalies of the exchange of the primary and permanent dentition. As is illustrated in this radiograph, there is an anomalous development involving the fusion of a supernumerary tooth with a permanent lateral incisor. Additionally, the level of maturation of permanent teeth may be ascertained from these films. As can be seen in this developing bicuspid. The extent of calcification of permanent teeth may also be seen as is observed in the development of this permanent first molar. Note that the area where the developing second bicuspid should be at present shows no development and probably denotes a congenitally missing tooth. Three, pathology of the teeth and jaws may be ascertained from the periapical radiograph. And as illustrated here, there is a periapical area involving the apical region of this mandibular permanent incisor. Either congenitally missing teeth or supernumerary teeth may be viewed on periapical films, as are seen in this periapical film where there are several supernumerary teeth. Additionally, impacted teeth, as is viewed here with an impacted bicuspid, or odontomas may be viewed from periapical films. The environment of the root ends or the bifurcation area may also be viewed and the periodontal ligament, the lamina dura, and periapical bone may be evaluated from these periapical films. As you can see, the periapical bone and the bone in the bifurcation area has been lost with this primary first molar. And you see the involvement of that area. Additional periapical or anterior clusal radiographs should be secured to augment 
any of the three pedodontic radiographic surveys where information regarding pathology or anomalous development is deemed inadequate from the routine survey. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.